The subject tonight is holiness. I don't know how many of you have had any knowledge of the great Anglican bishop of the 19th century called J.C. Ryle. Well, I shudder to think what J.C. Ryle would make of the Anglican Church today. I really do. He wrote a book, and his books are not the things to tickle the imagination. His books are the things which dig deep, and they're not for casual reading. They really need to be read when you're quiet and you've got time to think about things. And particularly helpful it is to have a notepad alongside because some of the things he deals with are of such great depth. I have one of those books. I've had it many years. It shares one great thing with the Bible, and that is truth. And it's a sort of book, if you are a true believer, that book, like the Bible, should be something you never get tired of reading. I've got many books on hobbies and things like that. If somebody wanted to really punish me, they could easily set me on one of my favourite books and read it and read it and read it and I'd be in, in, in the end just fed up. I want to read something else. But you see, the biblical truth that J.C. Ryle brings is that which we need inside us. And the particular thing that I had recently been looking at, and then I thought, I can do something for the assembly there at Chartridge. It's only, if you like, a broad brush. Something to just make us stop and consider. And for greater depth, I would recommend G.C.'s Ryle book. It's just called Holiness, and that is tonight's topic. The subject of holiness has seldom been, in my lifetime, a favourite topic. And looking at the state of the nations in the Western world, Today, it gets less and less. It's not the only subject which is very often neglected. It seems to be shunned. People don't want to know. And this is a very troubling thing. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 8, the Apostle Peter very early on, said to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And you think, well, that's not a very nice thing to say. I mean, here's Jesus, who's already, you know, his ministry started. Why say that to him? There was another incident about a thousand years before that and the speaker was none other than King David and he was king at the time and I'm sure most people who read their scriptures will be familiar with one of the Psalms relating to a specific incident Psalm 51 He had been caught out with his adultery with Bathsheba. And the prophet Nathan 
had gone to him and said, you are the man. And that did it. He realised all that was wrong. It was easy to ignore God's warnings then and it's easy to ignore God's warnings now when we merely follow traditions. At the time of David there had already been a lot of trouble with people paying, as it were, lip service to what happened in the temple, or the, actually the tabernacle, originally. And we've only got to look back at the time of Eli, whose two sons were everything but holy men. And what about the young child who was brought to Eli? A great prophet. And what happened? His sons did not follow in the same way. And the Bible says this in both cases. It's not guesswork on my part. It's all there. <clears throat> The greatest danger of all, of course, is when mankind's traditions become more important than the word of God. And there are plenty of churches in this country today which have been for decades going down that slippery slope of allowing the way we do things to get in the way. And the word of God has been pushed out of the picture. And it is particularly a problem when in today's Western world we have got so many churches, supposed churches, which are just degenerative they really are they'd far rather have their traditions and their fanciful ways of doing things than God's precious word they don't want to know it and yet that is what brings us the message from God himself. We find more and more there's less interest in what the Bible says in these days and more people would be far happier to just tell us that science tells us something else. Well, science, I can promise you, cannot give us the good news. And true science, in fact, is only showing us what God has done in his creation. When I was a child, Although I couldn't tell you them, I was made to understand that there were things called the Ten Commandments. Now, many people lost sight of those years ago. And to others, who may be aware that they're in the service and in some churches they're read every week, 
rather than being treated as the Ten Commandments, they barely get to the level of being Ten Suggestions. And people just do what they want. But the fact is that they are the Ten Commandments and they were given by God himself. And we can read them all in Exodus 20, 1 to 17 and Deuteronomy 6. Sorry, Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 22. So, going back to what I said earlier about Peter, what he said to Jesus, and about King David in Psalm 51. Why did they say what they did? It was because something in them challenged them. We can understand that the moral laws of the countries have become generally so vile and disgusting that most people do not seem to believe that God even exists, let alone do they claim any connection or allegiance to the creator of all things. And once we have removed God and his claims to our lives, which he has, and the church has become somewhere people are entertained, rather than hearing God's word proclaimed, then it's only a small step for blasphemous things to be said and done. And the so-called church does not speak out. I've got a few verses I'd like just to read from Jeremiah chapter 5. <clears throat> the last two verses of chapter 5 say, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? It remains an unanswered question in that chapter. What will you do in the end? When we go on a journey, any journey you care to think of. It's a good idea to know where we're going. Now you may think that that is a, a daft thing to say, but having worked in London in the 1960s and 70s, a frequent sight when we were just out walking at lunchtime were tourist buses with the occupants being the tourists from other countries. And it was obvious that the guide had just said, if you look to the right, you will see, because they would all stand up with their cameras and take their pictures. I shan't mention the worst country's offenders, um, but there was one country we jokingly used to say, when they came here, they didn't know where they were going. When they got here, they didn't know where they were. And when they got back home, they didn't know where they'd been. 
is uh, t typical, if you like, British tongue-in-cheek, I know, but it serves a purpose for me tonight. When we think of what is being taught in some of the churches, and many of the people, if you ask them what was their journey about, they wouldn't have the clue what you were talking about. But life, our human life, is a journey. When we are saved, that isn't, that's it. I'm saved. That's the beginning of the journey. We have the Christian life to live. As an American immigrant said to me on a return to this country once, we should walk the walk, not talk the talk. And it's so very true. So not only do we really need to know where we're going, we also should ask ourselves, what do we need for the journey? And it's exactly the same for a person coming to faith or trust in the redemptive, atoning work of Jesus, God the Son, the promised Jewish Messiah, and his resurrection from the dead, to understand the journey we are on as believers in this life. Do we know where we are going? It has to be understood that in creation, all that was in creation was intended to be done in God's way, not man's. Man was put in the garden to tend all that God had done. But of course sin entered in and spoilt it. And it is a, a very nice uh, thing to, to read in the prophet Isaiah chapter 55 <clears throat> and verses 6 to 9. They're very profound words. They're well known. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And it goes on to say this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reason for all that I've said is that holiness is not an option. Holiness is a command. It's not a suggestion. When we read in Romans and chapter 13, it told us there, to cast off the works of darkness, to put on the armour of light, to walk properly, not in revelry and, dis and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, and summed it up by saying this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision 
for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. That and what we are so familiar with in the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, it talks about be holy. Now it isn't God being rude, but he doesn't say please. It is a command. Be holy. And there is something that we will be looking at here because if when we are saved the Father looks at us through Jesus he doesn't see my sin because my sin has been dealt with at Calvary by Jesus my sin has already been judged So why does he tell us, if he sees us as if we are holy, why does he say, be holy? The reality is that he wants us to be holy because that will honour him. And all things that are done should be for the honour and glory of his name, not mankind. And an appreciation of those three passages, Isaiah 55, Romans 13, and 1 Peter 1. I think we all benefit from thinking about them carefully. It's a very serious charge that I make, but most people who are true believers, I do not think they take holiness seriously. I'm talking about true believers. It isn't something which actually goes across their minds. It concerns them little. But the fact is, the consequences of ignoring it are serious. Because being a commandment, if we don't obey it, we're disobeying it. It's quite simple. There's no middle road, grey area. It's quite straightforward. And to see how things can slide and escape from this road of holiness. I want to share something with you. Some years ago, a very well-known brother in the Lord was preaching, and I was there. And he said something which really concerned me. He actually said, and this is as near word for word as I can re remember it about 35 years ago. That we should, quote, go to the pubs to show them, the worldly people, that we are no different from them, end of quote. And I sat there and I thought, no, I didn't mishear you. Now I'm going to state my personal position and I'm not standing in judgment over anybody at all. I do not drink alcohol as a beverage sort of thing. Out of personal choice. The reasons are several but I can tell you that uh, in 2012, my youngest cousin died. Unfortunately, he, the funeral had already taken place when I found out. 
And because of doing the family tree, I asked his elder sister, who's about nine years older than me, if she could spare a copy of the, of the death certificate. Oh, yes, she said. It's all right. I've got several copies. So she sent me it. Now, my cousin, even from the time he was legally allowed to go into the pub, had regular exercise of this arm, going like this. He was never happier than when there was a pint in his hand. Cause of death, cancer of the liver, and cirrhosis of the liver. What causes it? Alcohol, generally. As far as I can understand, he died a pauper. He'd lost everything. He was so hooked on the drink. He was actually sleeping on the couch at a friend's house for a long, long while. Now, I'm not going to say to you that going to the pub is per se sinful. I'm not coming to you and saying, thou shalt not drink alcohol. I haven't an 11th commandment, it's all right. And my position is, if someone invites me to go to the pub, be it for a meal or not, and I feel it right to go, I will go. And I'm quite happy with my pineapple juice or apple juice. I've had some peculiar looks from landlords in the past, I must admit, but there we are. I don't have any problem with it. I don't come out of the pub looking around and seeing if there's anybody from the church there. Would they see me coming out of a pub? What would they think? I do it with a clear conscience. But what the preacher that I was talking about had said wasn't just about going into the pub. It was to show them that we, the born again, blood washed people, were no different from them. And putting it politely, I beg to differ. My Bible tells me something rather different. And there are two particular references I would just leave with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And... Galatians 6, verse 15. And these two tell me that in Christ Jesus, a true believer is a new creation. The worldly are not a new creation. They are the unsaved that need to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ who came to save those who would hear his message. We are a new creation in Jesus Christ. We are not the old man patched up. We are a new creation. The life that we live is a new life. It has a new direction, a new purpose. God's way, not our way. We are not our own. And part of this is how we live. Holiness, the word, the subject, 
does not save us. Holiness is what we should be and it's what God wants. And the quote in 1 Peter chapter 1 is straight from Leviticus chapter 11 verses 44 and 45. We are not our own. We are not of this world. Our aims, our behaviour, our attitudes should be those of the kingdom of God, not the deceiver of mankind. And in the letter to the Hebrews, it actually says that without holiness, no one will see God. Well, thank God, and I mean that, thank God that he sees us as holy because he sees us through Jesus. But he wants us, he commands us to be holy. A life lived to the Lord should actively seek to exalt our Lord. It is not intended as a Christian to magnify mankind. And it's with all that we say and do and think, for that matter, that our Lord should be glorified and honoured. The concept of holiness can be difficult for people to understand. And perhaps I should give a parallel to clarify what holiness is intended to convey. A very simple everyday thing. It is considered, generally speaking in this land, to be a basic courtesy to say thank you. But what does the Bible say? It's very interesting, actually. You see, we're quite familiar and usually quite happy to say thank you. That's when we were children. We'd be pulled up on the spot by a parent saying, and what do you say? <coughs> oh, yes, thank you. But you see, what's happening is we're just saying it. The Bible says something very different. The Apostle emphasizes in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 17. I can get my hands on it. Very interesting. Just listen very carefully. Colossians 3, 15 to 17. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in which also you were called in one body, and be thankful... That's the first one. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonition. Admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts in, to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It says giving thanks. It's not saying, saying thank you. So what is the difference between saying thank you and what the Bible consistently teaches? 
And you see with Paul, there's quite a lot of it. You see, he's emphasizing that it's something within us, not a word, but a, a, a way of the spirit to be thankful. We don't say of someone, you've got to say to somebody about kindness. You're told to be kind. It's got to come from the inside. And it isn't just with what Paul said. We find it right back in Psalms. And I just made a, a quick note to Psalms 100, 105, 106, 107, 118, 119, and 136. A replete with this idea of being thankful. Not just saying words. Not just saying thank you. And it's the same with holiness. It's not something we can put on and we become a holy person. But the holiness is about being holy. Taking on what God wants us to take on in our lives through the Spirit and that the Spirit would change us so that although God sees us as holy through our Lord Jesus Christ, he wants us to also be holy. And I say, as before, it is a commandment. It shouldn't be just words, but a part of us. Holiness. Holiness is commanded by God, and it's not optional. It has to be part of this new creation, the born-again believer. We're different. We should not be worldly, seeking the world's passing fancies. The scripture put it quite clearly. We are in the world, but not of it. May that be very true. And finally, the question, why? Why do we need to be holy? Well, as I've already mentioned, in redeeming sinners, God has declared us to be righteous. And I want to read you a verse from Romans chapter 3. I'm quite sure, and I can remember from the days of the Billy Graham Crusades, one of the verses we, they made sure we knew was Romans 3, verse 23, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But what does it say afterwards? I wonder how many people... You know what verse 24 says? Because it doesn't have, hasn't got a full stop after God. It's a comma. And it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God has declared us to be righteous in Christ Jesus. And righteousness with God means right with God, right in God's sight. It's not a, a world view. And he's fur, further declared us to be holy. And you might say, well, where does it say that? Well, in the first letter to, uh, of Peter, he says in chapter 2 and verse 9, 
you are a holy nation. Now, there are two things I want to do. First of all is dismiss the wrong use of this verse because it is used by people who believe that the church has replaced Israel in saying to the Christians, you are a holy nation. And the implication there is that God's fed up with the Jews. Never mind. But that isn't what it means. You see, when we, we look at the scripture, we find that there's a tremendous verse in what I personally treat as the greatest theological book ever written even in the Bible, and that is the book of Romans. And in chapter 1, and verse 16, it says this, Paul speaking, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And then it goes on to say this, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek, for the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith or by trust. But notice that it's to the Jew first. So whereas in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 it says you are a holy nation the people he is talking to and the beginning of his letter talks about to the pilgrims of the dispersion that's all those who've gone away from uh, the promised land to avoid persecution and taking the gospel with them. It wasn't just the Jewish converts. In other words, the Messianic Jews. But it was the converts from the Gentiles. The Messianic Gentiles. It's the Messianic people. You are a holy nation. And it's quite some calling. What is meant by holiness? It is simply for us to daily be more like our Lord, living up to our calling, the redeemed of God, to be like him, as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And this is not just for the Jewish believers, but for the Gentile ones as well, as we saw in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. But what does 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 say? It says this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let holiness be our focus in life, in every part of our being. And in that passage of Romans we read Earlier, Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. It must be all for the Lord, not 
for self. Amen.